us. But also, as always, we want to greet everybody who's in the house. And so we thank the Lord for those who have come out and gathered. Are we ready for the word? Yeah. Amen. As always, we've been digging into the word and we're going to continue to dig into the word because the word of God is where our hope is. The word of God is where our strength is. And as the Bible says, this is where our faith is built. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, that becomes the foundation for growth. If you're going to grow your faith, if you're going to grow your life in God, you've got to become a person who enjoys the Word, not just reads the Word. You've got to enjoy the Word. You've got to find joy in the Scripture. The Scripture is where Jesus introduces himself to you again and again. That's how you get to know him. That's how you get to meet him. Every time I read the Word, I feel like I'm meeting him again. You know, I don't know about you, but have you ever gone on a first date? Okay. Well, most of y'all who are married, I hope you did. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't, I don't want to know about your story. <laughs> you know, they have those TV shows, Married at First Sight. No, no, mm -mm, no. I need you to know I stopped watching horror movies when I got saved. <laughs> And I saw one of those clips the other day, married at first sight, and I thought, oh, that ain't good for nobody. Mm -mm. No, sir, buddy. Now, that's, but that's what it is. Jesus, when you are walking with the Lord and you begin to get into the Word over and over again, it's like being introduced. It is that intimacy of knowing God that suddenly he reveals his face to you again. That's what intimacy is. Intimacy means look into me. So into me, see. See into me. When you're getting into the scripture, you're looking into the face of God. You're looking into the heart of God. It is God inviting you to greater intimacy with him because he reveals himself through the book. So when people have been saved a long time and they keep saying, I don't feel like I know God, I go, okay, you've got to change your mind about Scripture. Because if you're reading the book and you still feel disconnected from God, then you're reading it through the lens of religion. If religion keeps you in the mindset that God is judging you, that he's angry with you, that something is wrong, then when you read Scripture, you're hiding from him. Because you keep feeling like Scripture is going to judge you. Instead of understanding that he is a loving father, he is a great king, he is a healer and restorer and redeemer, and when you find him in Scripture, he's inviting you to go deeper. And it's like stepping into a house where the house is open to you. It's like seeing someone that you love and you know they're ready to hug you. That in the midst of this encounter, life is being exchanged. That's the beauty of the word. Every time I open the Bible, I believe life is about to be exchanged. That he's going to speak to me. He's going to heal me. He's going to restore me. He's going to change my mind. That's the beauty of the word. And if that's how you view the word, when you read the word, you will be changed. But if you open the word thinking that it's just a story, it's just a good old book, there's no life in this. You will always receive what you believe it to be. You can only get life if you believe there's life in it. You can be transformed if you believe transformation abides in the Scripture. Jesus said this, this, and I'm trying not to get off topic because I got to get back to this Scripture. Jesus said something amazing. When he was rebuking the Pharisees of the day, he said, the problem I have with you is you think you have life in the Scripture. We know life is in the Scripture. But he says to the Pharisees, you think you have life. You not only don't go in, but you keep everybody else out. <laughs> what a powerful statement. He says to the greatest students of the Word of that day. They were the students of Scripture. They were the teachers of Scripture, but they were the critics of Scripture. They learned the word enough to tell everybody else what it couldn't do. They understood prophecy enough to say it hadn't happened. 
while they were in the middle of it being fulfilled, they were looking at the fulfillment of Scripture and saying it hadn't happened yet. They studied the God of healing and they said healing is not a sign that he's here. They understood the God of deliverance, but while Jesus was casting out devils, they denied his power. Don't become a student who becomes a critic. Because the thing that disconnects you from the power of God the most is when you know enough scripture to judge it, but not enough to follow it. Woo! Please don't get stuck somewhere deciding that God cannot do all that God can do. That's how we create denominations. A denomination stopped in one revelation of God. One. One. I have no problem with a Baptist, but he does more than drop you in water. Amen. 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 I, have no profit, I have no problem with a Methodist, but God is more than methodical. You have to know the foundation of every denomination. I have no problem with the Presbyterian, but he's more than the regalia and the mindset. It, I have no problem with Pentecost, but it's more than just speaking in tongues. So what happens to all of us is we have one experience and your history connects to that experience. And whatever your experience was, you build a mountain. And in that place, we say, I need to see this, and if I don't see this, it's not God. That's what the Pharisees did. So they judge that if God isn't doing the one thing we're looking for, he's not doing anything. But he's got to be bigger than the one thing you've seen. He's got to be bigger than the one thing you know, because God invites you into more. And we get stuck missing the rest of God. Because we've been told by our friends and family, this is all God is doing. But what if God is doing more? Ooh, good golly, Miss Molly. What if God is doing more than what you're looking for? What if you've told God you need to see everybody fall out? And God says, we ain't falling out today. We're going to weep today. What if we're all weeping and God says, now we've cried enough, let's laugh. What do you do when you're in a place where they're not used to holy laughter and everybody starts laughing? Well, now I've been there. I've been in a meeting where everybody was weeping like a baby and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost hits the room and a couple of folks start laughing and all the ushers stood to attention. Do we need to carry them out? They're being too happy. <laughs> I had a pastor take the mic and he said, I know we have some people laughing and I think it's God, but we're not sure. <laughs> it had been so long since they'd seen joy, they had to check with the Holy Ghost. I mean, <laughs> what happens when God decides not to do it your way? Oh, See, that's part of where we are in this season. That's part of where we're going. You cannot be prepared for God unless you understand God is more than your experience. Because when God says he's going to take you somewhere new, you've got to realize that means you've never been there before. What do you do when God decides to take you somewhere you're not comfortable in? Ooh. Yes, there you go. <laughs> See, you, you have to be prepared to leave behind you everyone who's not ready to go into the new with you. Tell them about it. Invite them. But many of us don't step into the new because we're waiting for everybody stuck in the old to agree. What do you do when God says, I'm taking you into the new and you've got to be first? And it's going to be uncomfortable, and they're going to think you're crazy, and they're going to tell you you're being too much, and they're going to say you're being super spiritual, and they're going to ask you why you're not satisfied. What do you do when God decides to make you the first fruit of a new revelation? Come, come on, Deborah. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Somewhere we've got to decide 
that God, I don't mind looking unusual. I don't mind my family thinking I'm a little crazy. I don't mind stepping out in faith because if somebody's going to see a miracle, I want to be the first one in my family to get it. Let them believe by watching me. But you've got to be willing to step in. Woo. Okay, I hadn't even read a scripture yet. I just, I came in stirred up. I, I had a nap. That's what happened to me. I had a nap. <laughs> Thank God for naps. Naps are wonderful. Oh, God is doing great things. I'm discovering three things in life you cannot live without. The Holy Ghost, the Word of God, and a nap. You know, when a child is young, you realize if you give them a nap, they act good the rest of the day. They're getting cranky. Put them down. <laughs> and somewhere around 45, I realized... <laughs> It took me that long. I'm slow, brother. I'm slow. Somewhere around 45, I realized, you know, if I take a nap, I like people better. <laughs> Seem like the world operates at a right speed. I don't have to pray as much about stuff. <laughs> yes, a nap helps your soul be right. Okay. I found out I didn't have to have bail money anymore. You know, you keep... <laughs> <laughs> I used to keep bail money in the car just in case anybody sent me off. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a partially a lie, partially, partially. Okay, as we, <laughs> as we talk about walking in the kingdom and who we are in God, I want us to touch on a couple of things. So if you're making notes tonight, I want you to write down Ephesians 6 and 12. Okay, let's dig into this. Ephesians 6 and 12. The Bible says something amazing, and we have to hold on to it so we can understand. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So say this with me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. So understanding that spiritual growth, your spiritual life is always going to require you to wrestle with something. There's a wrestling match that goes on in those that grow. And there is a compromise that goes on in those that don't. You cease growing when you start compromising. Whenever you decide that whatever is pushing against you, whatever you used to resist, whatever God has called you to counter in culture, whatever it is God has put in you, every one of us has a different calling. God has designed every one of us to resist something. For some of you, when you see injustice, it just robs you. It just rubs you the wrong way. You can't stand injustice. For some of you, it's oppression. When you see anyone without a voice and they're being mishandled, you rise to attention. For some of you, the thing you hate the most is poverty. You, when you see anyone that doesn't have enough, your heart breaks. You want to make sure you go out and serve them and you're there for them. Others of you, what you hate is seeing anybody sick. You have a call upon you to bring healing and comfort. For those of you, you hate seeing families that are just torn apart. There's a call upon you for counsel and for restoration. For some of you, you hate seeing anyone lost. Anytime you see someone walking in a lost state of mind, you call to attention. You want to see them born again. Every one of us has a different call or something that pulls you. God put that inside of you. That's the wrestling. The wrestling means every one of us is designed to take some giant down. Now, you may not have known it because that thing that was in you has always been in you. Ah, I'm, I'm going to teach this thing tonight. See, Paul says, I, Paul, was called an apostle from my mother's womb. But for the beginning of his life, he didn't know what an apostle was because the word apostle is not found in the Old Testament. It is the only word used by the fivefold ministry, never used until the new covenant. 
Yeah, the word apostle does not come up. It does not have a Hebrew connector. The teacher does. The evangelist does. The pastor does. Pastor was shepherd. The prophet does. Prophets were always prophets. So all of the other four gifts show up in the old covenant, but the word apostle does not because the word apostle comes from the Greek mindset of an apostille. An apostille was a written um, letter given to those who were sent from Rome to change culture. So the word apostle has a new covenant revelation because it comes from the New Testament thought process of changing culture. The other four gifts are to change the heart and the mind. The apostle is to change the culture. So when he's writing, he says, I was an apostle from my mother's womb. He's writing to people who only know what an apostle is from the Greek fault of taking over culture. I'm going somewhere. So when he begins to write these things and Peter says, Paul writes stuff that the rest of us don't understand. Because Paul is writing from the mindset of taking over territory. Everybody else had the mindset of God takes over the heart. Paul begins to talk about God doesn't just want your heart. He wants your territory. He wants your family. He wants your business. He wants your company. He wants your neighborhood. So he's writing and Paul is saying, I see something bigger than what we've understood. That God is not just after my heart personally. He wants my heart so that everybody around me can be changed. It's now the understanding of the kingdom authority. That the authority of the kingdom reaches outside of you to your family and reaches outside of your family to your neighborhood and reaches outside of your neighborhood to your whole community. That the authority of the kingdom, the Old Testament was I've got to stay saved while I'm in bondage. Because we went into Egypt and we went into Babylon and wherever we were, the covenant worked while we were in bondage. The New Testament says, I'm not just staying saved while I'm in bondage, but wherever I go, everybody around me must become like me for the kingdom has no borders. So now the gospel goes from being something that you use to survive to the power to change anything. So the revelation you have to take when you go from Old Covenant to New Covenant is when you read the Old Testament, it's about how did they survive? For God kept rescuing them. God kept fighting their enemies. God kept showing up. But the New Testament is not about surviving. The New Testament is taking territory. That while they're in prison, God shows up and knocks the chains off their wrist and saves the leader of the prison and everybody in the prison when the Paul stands up and says, hurt not thyself, for we are still here. It is God that has delivered us, and everybody in the prison got saved. That didn't happen in the old covenant. In the new covenant, while they come to kill them, they take Peter and they beat him and they tell him speak no more in this name Jesus and while they send them back Peter says now Lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all power we may yet preach Jesus with boldness and the Holy Ghost fell again upon them all the New Testament is not about surviving it's about taking territory So God is saying to us, you've got to have a new mindset because most of us, we're reading the Bible like nothing changed. So we're reading the New Testament just like we read the Old Testament, hoping, hoping that God will show up, hoping that there will be power, hoping that something changes. But when you read the New Covenant, you've got to understand that the hope has been fulfilled, that power has been released, and that God says, if you're willing to wrestle I'm willing to give you victory. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. We do wrestle. So the question now is what did God call you to wrestle with? Mm. Mm. What did God call you to wrestle with? If you don't know where he's called your strength to be, your strength will never have value. You will always be wrestling with the wrong issues. 
See, most prophets are called to wrestle with injustice. That's why most people who are very prophetic, they only see black and white. They don't have no gray area. It's hard to get prophetic people to understand gray area. Now, all these folks running around who are, y'all are just dripping with mercy. You got all this mercy, mercy, mercy. Now, trust me, prophetic people have mercy too. But prophetic people are God's gift to the body so that mercy is not abused. So, prophetic folks show up and say, now, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> didn't we pray? Didn't the Lord speak? Well, then let's move on. But God has those who have the gift of mercy who say, hold up. Because if we move right now, we're going to lose some people. So, let's not destroy. Let's not move too fast. So, there has to be a balance. If you don't know where your calling is or what you're designed to wrestle with, you'll be focused on the wrong thing. So, God is calling us. Paul says, I was called to wrestle with what? Nations. I'm going somewhere. Paul says, I understand my calling is not the same as Peter's. Peter is called to wrestle with what? The Jewish mindset. So, he is called to stand amidst the Jewish people and give them the revelation that God is with them and bring them into the deeper covenant of God. Paul says, that's not my wrestling match. He said, I know that I have been sent unto the Gentiles. So, Paul had to think different. He had to talk different. He had to move different. And when Paul shows up to talk to Peter, he rebukes Peter and says, you know your calling." is to wrestle with their culture so that they would step into fulfillment. And instead of wrestling with the culture, you become back just like the culture. Woo! So he says to Peter, how dare you who have tasted of the heavenly thing convince them to go back under the celebration of new moons and events. Ah, come on, escalations. So, He's rebuking Peter. Why? Because Peter yielded to the thing he was supposed to wrestle with. Woo! When he's talking about Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, let no one attack your youth. Why? Because he had put Timothy in place as a pastor, so your job is to wrestle with the family structure in the city you're in because they don't know how to be good family. So, I'm putting you in as my son. As my son, I fathered you. So, a man who had no children fathers those that had parents and creates new family. And they become examples of family to break the back of that Gentile mindset where they were all sleeping around with different people and they didn't understand righteousness and they didn't know how to have good family because the culture of their day was family was perverted. So, Paul heals family by building a kingdom model. So, he says, Timothy, let no man hate your youth. I've been teaching you since you were 14. You are my son. Do it the way I've shown you. And if they say anything to you, act like a pastor and shut them down. You have my authority, but they're coming after your youth. You've got to wrestle with this. You've got to wrestle with this. Timothy, I'm putting you in a position where they're going to wrestle against you. Ah. So, what are you called to wrestle with? Because wherever God has placed you, someone is going to wrestle against your authority. And God is not, hear how I say this, God is not going to deliver you from your assignment. Ooh. <laughs> God is not going to deliver you from your assignment because the Word says we wrestle not, but we do wrestle. So, flesh and blood is not your problem. Flesh and blood, say that with me, flesh and blood is not my problem. So, God says, 
when you start complaining about flesh and blood, I don't like the way these people act. I can't stand the way they talk to me. Lord, every time I show up at work, somebody's crazy. Lord, why don't they just act better? God says, okay, you don't get it. Because the word makes it clear, flesh and blood is not your problem. So we say this scripture in God's presence, and when we read it, but then we get in the car after work. I can't believe these people. <laughs> they got one more time. One more time. Oh, if she look at me like that, one more, one more again, one more again. <laughs> Woo, Lord, I'm asking you. <laughs> Some of us keep one more, just one more on our phone. I don't know who one more is. <laughs> But we call on one more more than we call on Jesus. You got one more. Who is one more? <laughs> now, here's the thing. How you respond in the wrestling match determines how long it goes. How you respond in the midst of the wrestling determines how long it goes. So, if the flesh and blood keeps getting you to respond like you're losing, you will not escape that wrestling match. Woo! Is this helping anybody tonight? Listen, I know we ain't made it past one scripture, but we're going to sit on this for a minute. Because as I've been praying for us in this season and talking to God, the Lord keeps saying to me, it's a season where people have forgotten who they're wrestling with. The loudness of complaining, the lack of peace, the sound of trouble that we're producing in our relationships is the sign you've forgotten who you're wrestling. Because those that are spiritual, the first place you go to battle is in the spirit. When trouble is created in relationships, you don't run to the person first and have a conversation where somebody needs to tell them what they did. Why didn't you pray first? You are a spiritual being with spiritual authority. You have kingdom victory. God his, listens to you. God's voice is in your ear. His authority is in your heart. His power is in your voice. And God says, before you started fighting, why didn't you pray? Before you called them to tell them everything that was in your mind, why didn't you first tell God what was in your heart? Before you told them how they needed to change, did you ask God to help them change? Before you let somebody, one of your dumb friends, because we all got at least one dumb friend. We do, we do. We keep, all of us keep at least one dumb friend so we can feel better about our lives. <laughs> you know you do, you know you do. Now, don't call them after service and let them know which one they are. <laughs> but we all got one dumb friend. And you know who that friend is because you call them when you feel bad about life just so they can convince you you're right. Because they always agree with your bad choices. That's why you keep them. Because when you really start to grow, the first thing you do is you start asking, why am I still friends with them? <laughs> you see, because if you're keeping people around you to validate your lack of maturity, you are an enemy to your own destiny. When you keep people around you who validate your immaturity, you are an enemy to your own destiny. You are killing your own movement in God by surrounding yourself with people who let you stay unchanged. People who really want to grow in God, people who have decided to wrestle and take a territory, people who have decided to let God mature them, they surround themselves with people who challenge them, people who make you grow, 
People who, when you do something that's not like God, they ask you a question. Was that really the Lord? I don't have people around me who just agree with me. I don't because when I did, life wasn't good. Because every time I was upset, they said, oh, you're right to feel that way. And I realized later, you're not helping me. So suddenly, and it took years because as you mature, you learn. I began to surround myself with people who went after God like I go after God. So when you would call them and say, this is going on, the first thing they would say was, well, what would the Lord say about it? Well, how can I be mad now because you're asking me, did I pray? So when they say, what did the Lord say about it? The wrestling match stops because I can't be mad in the flesh anymore. Because if I've got to talk to the Father, now my emotions have to come under control. The second question they would always ask was, have you forgiven them? Well, they just did it. <laughs> but did you forgive them? I'll forgive them in a minute. Nope, that's not how this works. At the moment they do it, you forgive, not when they ask for forgiveness. So if you'd already forgiven them, I love this. One of my mentors, Jerry Bench, great man of God who's gone on to heaven now. He was a phenomenal man of God. And when I first began to move in the, I was moving in the prophetic, but when I first began to move in the apostolic in some ways, we were doing a lot of work and he would invite us to Bakersfield. His church was the River Church. And I would go there and we would sit. First time I'd done it in my life, this was years ago. Jerry would put out three chairs. And he would sit me in a chair. He would sit beside me. And we would always have a dear woman of God, one of the two women of God who would work with the ministry. And sometimes it was um, Sister Sherry, and then sometimes it was a different, but most time it was Sherry. So we, the three of us would sit. And he would say, now, Michael is a prophet. Jerry was an apostle. And then we had Sherry. And Sherry was such a prophetic teacher. And we would sit together, and then we would teach a one subject, and the whole room would then ask the three of us questions. Phenomenal. That's how I began to learn to walk in this deeper and deeper. Now, we would start talking, and then afterwards, Jerry would say, oh, son, that was really good. He says, but now the next time you share that, you might want to make sure that you've let the Lord deal with your heart. I said, well, wasn't the revelation good? He said, the revelation was good. He said, but when you told that story, it sounded a little bit like you still hadn't forgiven them. I said, well, I thought I'd forgave them. He said, yeah, you're not old enough to know really when you forgive. <laughs> oh, this was years ago. I said, what do you mean I'm not old enough? He said, young folks think they've forgiven when they think they can get past it. Old folks know when it doesn't stir you up anymore, it's gone. He said, when you started talking, it sounded like you're still a little stirred. <laughs> you might want to take it back to God. I began to learn because somebody around me who was deeper and wiser did not let me stay at the same level. And he began to push me and say, now there's a place God is going to take you to where you're going into nations. He said, if you can't handle stuff in a city, a nation will break you. He said, so God needs you to deal with your emotional instability now because the wrestling match is not against people. He said, so if you're upset that somebody didn't show up to help you, he said, it wasn't their job to help you. That's God's responsibility. He said, it wasn't their job to make sure your ministry had open doors. That's God's responsibility. It's not their job to make sure your light bill was paid. That's God's. He said, everything that most people are upset about is God's job, not people's job. He said, so if you are still upset that people didn't come through for you, you are an infant in the spirit. Your covenant is with God, not people. So any offense you are carrying at someone who didn't show up for you, who didn't keep their word to you, they broke a promise, but they didn't have the covenant. Hear what I'm saying. They shouldn't have lied. They should have kept their word. But the responsibility for your life is between you and God. The promise is in the word from God, not people. 
And when you transfer responsibility to people, you feel the right to judge them and be offended that they didn't help you, they didn't show up, they broke their word. But you are a born-again child of God whose covenant is with the ever-living, ever-loving, ever-present king of the universe. And when you shift responsibility and say, God, you said you would provide for me. You said you'd keep my lights on. You said the righteous. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. So my covenant is with you. So when you shift responsibility to the king, you are no longer offended at people. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Most of what's stopping us from growing is we're still wrestling with people. People. My goodness, I got to get past this first scripture. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a couple of simple questions. A couple of questions. Have you learned to not wrestle with family? Every head in the room is going, no, no, not there yet, not there. <laughs> One of the greatest things in moving in the spirit is everyone has to learn how not to wrestle with family. See, walking in the spirit means you will have to confront family. You will have to put boundaries around family. You will have to build a healthy understanding of family, but you don't wrestle. So what does wrestling look like? Wrestling looks like every time you're about to interact with that member of family, you revert to the old you. Think about that. You happy, you're walking with the Lord, you're speaking in tongues. You're prophesying everywhere you go. You're at the gas station giving out words. You're in Walmart, Shondine, me tie my bow tie, me driving my Honda. You just rolling in revelation. You, you standing on the chili aisle about to buy some hot sauce and somebody walk by and you go, thus saith the Lord unto you. <laughs> Texas Pete, nah ha ha. So, now... <laughs> Now, here's the problem that <laughs> I know I went one step too far. I apologize. I, I did. I couldn't help it. Now, here's the problem. Because what happens is then as soon as you're in this moment, the one family member that has that wrestling with you, the phone call comes, you get home and they've left a message. Or worse than that, they're there. They're there. <laughs> you get there. Have you ever given, gotten back to your house or over to one of your family members' house and their car is there? And, and you have that moment where you think, let's just keep driving. You have that moment where you realize, mm, maybe the Lord ain't in this. <laughs> now, why, why am I touching on that? That means that you're still wrestling. Because if your peace leaves you because someone else is in the room with you, you have not mastered your soul. If you've given somebody else that much authority over your internal government, you are a slave to them. Woo, I need you to think about that. If you can lose your peace, your joy, your happiness, all that glory of God that's been flowing around you, you got testimonies, you done Instagram, you done Facebook, you done told everybody what God's been doing in your life, and five minutes with that sister, brother, cousin, parent can make you lose all of that, and you sitting there thinking, why are you here? And now all of that victory that should be transferable to them, 
all that victory that could be breaking yokes off of them, all of that glory that could be showing them who God really is. You've lost the ability to access it because you made them the owner of your emotions. You became a slave to their will. You've wrestled with family so long that you've learned how to go back to the old you in, your pre in their presence. So how do you break out of that? <laughs> I hope this is helping somebody. Is this helping anybody? Okay. So how do you break out of that? Number one, you have to honestly decide, I am not going back to those responses. So at first, it's going to feel very uncomfortable, but you're going to have to, in front of the family that ticks you off, makes you lose your peace, wants to remind you that they're trying to keep you in that old frame of mind, you've got to practice answering differently. Start there. Start there. This is stuff we don't teach about in church, but we need to. You got to start there. What does that mean? When normally you would shut down, some of you, you shut down completely because you don't want them to know you're still mad. So they're the only person you don't talk to. Well, then how do they not know? <laughs> you're saying hello to everybody else in the family and you see them and you're like, mm. <laughs> how do they not know you're not mad? You have allowed them to control your emotions. You hugged everybody else in the house, and you saw them and did the dap. <laughs> so you've got to realize when you first begin to connect, when you first begin to break that bondage, when you first begin to recognize that you're wrestling in the spirit and not in the natural, you have to make your body obey you. So you've got to say to yourself, I'm going to hug them like I hug everybody else. I'm going to greet them like I greet everybody else. I will not let them have victory over this. Yeah. Why? Because it's not them. It's the spirit behind them. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So stop acting as though they are the reason that you are in bondage. They are a person like you're a person. They don't have that much power over you. They don't have any authority given by God. The devil himself cannot make you do something unless you yield to it. So stop acting like that one person in your family has the authority to keep you a hostage to the old you. Every time I go visit family, I've got freedom, and then we're at Thanksgiving, and I'm sitting at the table. Like, what, well, why are you sitting there quiet? Open up your mouth and speak. I was invited to someone's house years ago, and everybody in their family was just off, off, <laughs> off, <laughs> off. <laughs> I mean, like, if I could have bought them some medication on the way to the meal, I'd <laughs> pour it in the bowl. I'm like, here's some chiclets. Just eat them. <laughs> Woo, y'all need these right here. Woo. Everybody. From the five-year-old to the ninth, everybody. <laughs> I mean, even the friend who invited me needed some help. But. And I went because the Lord told me to go. And then when I got there, I said, oh, you doing this to me. <laughs> and I realized why. I realized at that moment the reason my friend was so imbalanced the reason he suffered so much in his mind mentally, the reason he had had all these times where he would disappear for weekends and nobody knew where he was, I realized when I stepped into that family, this is what they've done to you. You've suffered this your whole life, and you've never learned how to respond differently. So we're sitting at the meal, and it's, it's like 19 family members, and they're talking crazy. <laughs> but I knew I was on assignment because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So while they're talking crazy, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm like, oh, yeah, because crazy is funny. 
<laughs> some of y'all got to give yourself some peace. You act like your job is to fix everybody's crazy. If you're not called to fix it, enjoy it and move on. <laughs> take notes, take pictures, enjoy it and move on. You might never see this again. <laughs> I know how to live at peace. I just look at some folk and I'm like, this is a good show. <laughs> I ain't never seen nobody do this. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm telling you, that nap helped me. Lord, this is a good night. <laughs> now, I'm sitting there. They're acting crazy. They're talking crazy. I'm just eating. I'm laughing. And then all of a sudden, I just, the Lord said, okay, it's time to do something different. I said, can I ask a question? And there, see, y'all, y'all know my questions now. Y'all have learned, y'all know my questions can be dangerous. I said, I just have a question for you. I said, what is your hope for your children? And they all stopped and looked at each other and said, what, what do you mean? I said, hope? I think you know what the word hope means. I said, H-O-P-E, hope. What is your hope for your children? I said, because everybody I've ever met wants their children to have more than they've had. I said, so what do you really want for your children? And they looked at each other and said, uh, well, a good life. I said, good. And what are you doing to make sure they can have that? And so they all stopped talking. They're looking at each other. They said, well, well we, 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 you know, we're, we sent them to school. And I said, that's good. I said, that's money. What are you doing? Well, we, we, you know, we, we told them they could, they could be anything they wanted. I said, great. And how did you confirm that? I said, so whenever they came and told you they were going to be something different than what you wanted, you stood behind them and said, go for it. And they went, uh, and one of the daughters said, oh, no, they ain't never done that. <laughs> I said, so I'm trying to figure this out. I said, I'm enjoying this meal. We're laughing. We're talking. I said, but it's like every time somebody says something y'all don't agree with, you feel like you need to fight each other. Well, this is how we are. You just, you just, you just in church. You just, you just saved. I said, yes, I am. I'm in church. I'm saved. I said, my mind is healed. I said, so I'm asking you, if you love each other, why do you fight so much? I said, I just won't know. I said, maybe y'all know something I don't know. And all of a sudden, the conversation turned. And so I said, well, can I just pray a blessing for you? See, there was no fight. I never once pointed out anything that I thought they were doing that was evil. I never once said, let's talk about the five generations and let's figure out which devil crawled up in your granddaddy somewhere and turn him. <laughs> You see, because what most of us do, we start looking for something to accuse them of. And whenever you look for accusation, it means you're wanting to fight. Because the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Accusation leads to a fight. Discernment leads to deliverance. Discernment is to know why a thing is the thing so that you can pray the thing out of the room. Accusation is learning who's at fault so you can put them on trial. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So for most of us in family, we're so busy trying to accuse whoever did the most wrong because we see them as the culprit, the guilty party, the criminal who has destroyed the emotions of the family, and we need to hold you hostage to what you did to us years ago. Instead of discerning, somebody broke them, somebody hurt them, they're only doing what they're doing because they didn't know any better, so let's find the spirit that's at the root of this, and let's dismantle the spirit instead of fighting with the person, because if they could do different, they would have done different by now. So there's a spirit at work. So if you discern the spirit, so we're sitting there at the meal, and all I prayed was, I said, Lord, I know this family loves each other, but I'm asking you now, Holy Spirit, would you just touch each one and let them know how much you love them? And all of a sudden, they start crying. 
And as they're crying, I just keep praying because, you know, once you got them, keep them. <laughs> and just kept praying. Father, I thank you that you're with them. And now I keep praying. All of a sudden, now they're just weeping. And I said, Holy Ghost, if there's anything to remove, can we just ask you to deliver right now? And suddenly, two of the people just start shaking. We're having a meal. A meal I didn't want to be at. <laughs> With people I didn't like. Over food that wasn't good. <laughs> You can't enjoy your meal when everybody fighting. But by the end of the meal, God showed up. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm going to tell you one more story. Has this been all right for tonight? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you one more story. We were in New Zealand, and I had done some ministry, and they said to me, we want you to come over, and we're going to cook a meal for you, this large family. Now, in America, a large family, you know, we think it might be 10, 15 people gathered around. 73 people showed up. It was all their family with a few cousins. <laughs> Ridiculous. And, and I don't know if you have, but you know, it was, Samo it was a Samoan family in New Zealand. And so, everybody was huge. 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 <laughs> I was the smallest person in the room. Now that's saying something. So we get there and we're stepping into the house and we only see a handful of people and then they're taking us through the house. It was Pastor Jim and myself and they said, we're taking you out to the house they call the fellowship house. I said, you built a house behind your house? Yes. This is where we do all our eatings when we come together. And they built a barbecue pit outside and all of this. And so that's when I see there's like 70-some people. We sit down, and they bring this platter in front of us. And it was all this crab and shrimp and stuff. And so Jim says, oh, thank you. I'll pass this down the table. And they said, no, no, that's your plate. <laughs> so we each had a platter. A platter, not a plate, a platter. And I said to them, I can't, nobody can eat this much food. And they said, oh, look around. Every person had a platter. <laughs> I thought, okay, y'all trying to kill somebody. <laughs> now, we're eating, we're worshiping, we're singing, we're having a marvelous time, we're telling stories. This is after days and days of ministry. We've seen miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, a habit I have is when anybody invites me to their home, you bless the house. The Bible says that if you bless a prophet in the name of a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. And so whenever I visit someone's home, I bless the house. So I said, can we join hands? I want to bless this house. We're holding hands. And I just begin to say, now, Father, I thank you you're in this house. I ask that the blessing of the Lord God Almighty may rest upon this dwelling place, that everything that has been out of order would come into order. And all of a sudden, we start hearing noises Upstairs, it's like this rolling, rumbling. So everybody is opening their eyes and looking around. I just keep praying. And we thank you for your glory that you're moving in this house right now. And it gets louder and louder. Now, I'm thinking it's kids upstairs playing or something. Well, they knew what nobody upstairs. So as we continue to pray, I said, for you are the Lord God Almighty, and you are here with this family. And as they have blessed us this day, I command blessing. When we said that, all of a sudden, the door opens up. We hear feet coming down the stairs. There's no body attached. As the feet go running outside, all of a sudden, this young man who's holding hands, he breaks hands with everybody, and he tears his shirt. It's like a movie. He tears his shirt off and he runs outside screaming. Now, as he's running outside screaming, no, Pastor June was with me. This is Pastor June in Guetta. He runs outside screaming. As he's running down the street, now several of the young men go to chase him because he's gone crazy. He's turned mad. He's screaming, and as they're trying to catch him, he starts, boom, boom, he's 
punching him in the face. He's knocking him out. Now, they're bloody, he's bloody, and they're grabbing him. They're calling his name. He doesn't know who he is. They're carrying him in the air and bringing him back inside. Now, as they bring him back inside, he's wrestling and screaming. Demons are talking out of him. I'm, this is, how do you deal with what you've been wrestling with in your family? It's not flesh and blood. So they're holding this young man, the youngest son in the family, and he's fighting them. He's punching them. Now, as they're holding him, they bring him inside, and when they get him back inside, he throws himself free again, and when he can't get past them, he runs straight into the wall and shoves his head through the wall. So now the wall is broken open. He's broken through, and he's got a little blood coming down side of his head. And they're trying to grab him. And I'm standing there. Why? Because this is your family. <laughs> now, I knew we were going to cast the devil out, but I am visiting. I want to see what you do because this is your family. So I said to them, what are you going to do? They said, well, this has happened with a couple other family members before. I said, yes, because you have a stronghold of insanity over the family that needs to be broken. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, you know, we're going to go and we're going to get him medicated. I said, medication ain't going to fix this one. I said, what are you going to do with him? So he's screaming. They've got people laying on top of him now, and he's throwing people in the air. And I look at Pastor June. I said, Pastor June, I said, you ready to pray? Let's deal with this. And I'm looking at the family, and they're all what? I said, spirit, and he stops. I said, you know who I am. I am a child of the living God, and I know who you are. You're defeated. Stop it. And he tenses up. I said, I didn't come to wrestle with you. You're coming out of him. And as we began to rebuke this thing, all of a sudden, I said, oh, I know what this is. I said, every time somebody older in the family dies, within a month, one of your young people go crazy. And they said, yes, his uncle died. I said, because y'all are passing spirits through your family. I said, all that, some of that crazy stuff y'all have done, I said, this is, this is passing through. I said, and because you have not brought the kingdom over your family, when someone older dies, them demons that have been following them, those spirits that they played with, is looking for somebody else in the bloodline to go to. So you keep having your young people around 16 or 17 lose their mind, but it's because every time somebody in their 70s or 80s dies, that spirit jumps. Because it gets around them and it looks for a door. See, some of us don't even understand how some of the spiritual world works. You've got stuff around families that the reason you're so mad at the grandfather or the grandmother or the great aunt for the evil they did that you never paid attention to the fact those were spirits that had taken them over. And now because you were so mad at them, you didn't put up the wall of defense in preparation. So now they die and all that mess is looking for somewhere in your family to go. And because you were so busy being mad and offended in the natural, you didn't even lay hands on your nieces and nephews and say, Father, we rebuke that it shall not rest on the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. So you were so busy wrestling in the natural and being mad, and I'm just glad they gone. Look, now the family is delivered. Those spirits been around your family for years. And if you don't look at it as a spiritual warfare instead of a natural warfare, it's looking for a door. And we keep giving spirits access because we wrestle in the flesh instead of the spirit. So while he's wrestling and screaming, we start calling it out. I said, in the name of Jesus, that's enough of you. Come out of him. All of a sudden, the whole family, we said to them, pray one prayer. Because he's now, he's, he's on the floor convulsing. And so we said to, there was an older woman of God there, and she was marvelous. We said, pray one prayer. And she started leading the whole family in one prayer. And the peace of God hit the whole house. I said, because y'all have not been in unity. If we can get all of y'all to pray one thing. And so they were praying one prayer, the Lord's Prayer. That's the only prayer they all knew. 
and they're all praying the Lord's Prayer together. Everything in the house calmed down. The boy falls asleep. Check this out. He slept for 16 and a half hours. Couldn't get him to wake up. They'd shake him and call him. I said, let him sleep. The Lord said he'll sleep until he's healed. When he woke up 16 and a half hours later, never happened again. Nobody else in their family has it ever happened to. The strong man was cast out. The stronghold was broken, and he was complete. But we had to deal with it in the spirit. I said, don't medicate this boy. Cast that devil out of him. I said, but the family, I said to them, the reason y'all weren't able to do it is because you're so busy calling it a family problem. We see this every few years in somebody else in our family that you've given the devil permission by calling it normal. And whatever you don't see as a spiritual problem, you will not have spiritual victory. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, but you do wrestle. And you've got to wrestle in the spirit. The place that we often don't have victory is in our own families because anybody else who's going through it will come up to them and give them a word, we'll lay hands on them, we'll give them the scripture, we'll prophesy to them. When it's family, we get frustrated and we act like they're doing it on purpose. And to have victory in your house like the kingdom of God has promised, you cannot treat people like it's them. You've got to go after this thing like it's a spirit. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, rulers of darkness of this world. Your wrestling match is up here. And if you wrestle here, you have victory here. But if you wrestle here, you'll never have victory there. You must choose where to wrestle. You must choose where to wrestle. If you wrestle in the spirit, victory follows you. If you wrestle in the flesh, pain is all you know. You have to choose which life to live. Choose which life to live. I start my day wrestling. I'm going to say this and then then I'm not going to be much longer. I start my day out wrestling. Before I get out of my pajamas in the morning, I have walked my floor wrestling. I know Debbie understands what I'm talking about. I walk the floor wrestling. I pray through every family member. That's how I start my prayer. Every day, I start with my own family. I appreciate praying for the nations and everything God is doing, but my house And I learned that from my mama and daddy. They start their day praying for us. My mama, she'll she'll call us and say, I picked you up in the spirit today. She'll say, she said, you you getting the cold? I said, how how you know I'm getting the cold? She said, I was praying for you this morning. I just felt like you had a little cough. I said, get out of my house. (laughs) I love it. That's what true prayer is supposed to be like, that you can feel your family. See, that's in the spirit. Now, in the natural, you make assumptions. In the spirit, you discern. I don't need anybody to tell me how most of my family is doing. I can tell them when I call them. I'll say, now, I was praying for you last night, and you're going through this. Yeah, that's right. I felt this. I called one cousin, and I said, I don't know who you just made a friend with, but you got to let them go. I said, I just felt a rope go around your foot. Somebody's about to trip you. I said, I was praying for you, and suddenly I felt like something grabbed my foot. I said, the Lord said, somebody you just connected to is trying to trip you up. And she said, oh, that's what she's doing. I get it now. I said, drop her like a hot potato. (laughs) See, God will let you discern if you wrestle in the spirit. I learned that years ago. That's how I pray for the churches we're connected to. When I begin to pray, I begin to pray and walk the floor. Lord, I thank you that you're blessing them. Now, anything that's not you, reveal it and take it down. I'm going to say this. For most of y'all, stop praying nice prayers. Your little nice prayers ain't changing nothing. 
Y'all got all these sweet little nice prayers, and you just, oh, Lord, I'm praying rainbows and puppies over everybody. I'm, I'm just praying today. They just had this marvelous day, and everything go. Okay, that's nice. That's nice, but that don't change nothing. And I'm not talking about praying on, against anybody. I'm talking about in the spirit. I'll give you an example. When I pray for my family, the first thing I begin to pray, I said, Lord, I thank you that today your hand is upon them. Open up their ears to hear your voice. Let them walk in your will. Anything that is not your will, I pray that you reveal it to them and keep them from them. I pray, God, that you cause every relationship they have to prosper and be of good success. But any relationship that is not from you, dismantle it, remove it, shake it to the ground. Let them have no comfort in it. God, I pray that you keep their feet in your will. Let them walk out your will. Let them do your will. Let them be servants to your will. But any choice they're about to make that's going to mess up their life, screw up their life, take them the wrong way, shut it down. God, don't let them have no peace if they're going to do something that's going to mess up their future. Keep them in your will, Papa. Lord, protect them from themselves. God, if they're not walking in the right mind, put their mind back on your word. Let them hear your voice. Keep them in your will. Now, Lord, I pray for me. Keep me walking right. Keep me talking right. Keep my mind stayed up. You've got to pray real prayers because real prayers get real results. And part of what we don't do for our family is pray real prayers. Don't you leave your house till you pray a real prayer for your family. A real prayer. I was praying for one of my cousins one time, and the Lord kept telling me I, every morning I woke up. I said, God, whatever is attacking her mind, I said, something is talking to her. And I don't know what it is, but God, I'm not going to rest till you deliver her from whatever's messing with her mind. I didn't know. For three months, she was fighting. And what it was, it was because of she had gone through a hard birth. We didn't understand all that back then. And that birth had left her postpartum. And so she had a postpartum depression and this thing. I didn't know it. Back then, they didn't treat it like they do now. So they leave you to yourself, and they just would tell women, you're going to be okay, instead of helping. I mean, some of you women in the room, you know. And sometimes when people don't come to help you, it leaves you alone. And so as I was praying, I, and I called her after a couple of months, and I said, I don't know what this is, but the Lord told me I could call you now. I said, have you been? She said, yes, I have. I said, lay your hand on your head. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command that thing to break. And she began to weep. She said, I don't know what just happened, but that thing broke off me. And her mind, her peace restored. You've got to deal with stuff in the spirit. It's not natural. It's not them they're not just trying to be mean. Deal with it in spirit. Treat your family in the spiritual realm like you would treat anybody else. And last of all, when you pray, pray the best. Speak well of them. Don't speak good words to everybody else and then with your family, you've always got something harsh to say. If we're going to have victory in our house, it starts by praying right and talking right. Pray right and talk right. How do you have a good word for everybody except the people you live with? You got a good prophetic word for everybody else and you never have a good prophecy for the people in your house? How is that possible? The people who I pray for the most are the people of my own house. The people who I speak about the best are the people of my own family. I don't love nobody better than the people in my own house. I'm crazy about them folks. You've heard me talk about my father and my mother for years. I'm crazy about them people. I think my brother is the best brother anybody's ever had. My brother is phenomenal. Phenomenal. My brother has for years. Every time he sees me, he's giving me stuff. I mean, I'm like, did you have to give me all of this? And he's like, yeah. He said, I only got one brother. I'm going to be good to you. I mean, be crazy if you want to. I choose not to be. I'm going to love the people of my own house. It's a choice. It's a choice. 
Is there disagreement? Sure. Do you have stuff you need to work out? Of course. But can you choose to be a blessing? Yes, you can. And do you need to confront stuff? Absolutely. Every family has things they've got to confront that does not stop you from being a blessing. No one gets to own your emotions. No one gets to control your destiny. And nobody can stop you from being you. You must choose. And in your own family, let that be the first place you start. Let the glory of God be seen. Let the peace of God be known. And let the prayer of faith be heard. Pray for your family in such a way that they know you believe God. Growing up, the one thing I'm thankful for is when my father, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts would pray. They prayed in such a way. My aunt used to tell me, she said, you know, you ain't got no choice. I said, what do you mean? She said, God dropped you in this family, in this family, you ain't got no choice. She said, we just going to pray you on into the kingdom. And, and when we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to live right and do right, they just look at you and go, you ain't got no choice. <laughs> My aunt said to me one time, she said, ain't nobody studying you. Now, I don't even know if y'all know what that means. That's all, okay. Those of y'all from the South say, I appreciate you. She said, ain't nobody studying you. That means nobody's paying you any attention. She said, I don't care how you respond to me. She said, I've talked to God about you. And God's made me a promise. She said, and you can go hard or easy, but you're going. <laughs> she said, you can make it easy or it's going to be difficult, but you're going to do what God called you to do. She said, because I'm wrapping you up in enough prayer that you're going to have to serve God. You can't escape my prayers. Now, that's a praying woman right there. When they would say to you, you can't, and I've become the same way. I have said to friends, I say to different people who I'm close to, if I pray about this, I promise you it's going to happen. I said, so let me know if I should pray. I tell people, I warn them in advance, if you really want this, let me know. I'm going to lay before the Lord and pray about it. If you don't want it, tell me now. Because once we pray this through, don't come back and say you didn't want it. My father had a prayer line at church one time, and he, he had called for people to come up, and everybody got in the prayer line. And we had a dear lady in the church. Her name was uh, Minnie Moya. And Miss Minnie was standing in the prayer line. And my father was praying for people. And Miss Minnie couldn't hear good. <laughs> and the whole church were looking, going, why is Miss Minnie in the prayer line? Because Daddy had said, he said, I feel the grace. God's going to give everybody a job who wants a job. And so all these people started walking up. Miss Minnie got up and we're thinking, Miss Minnie, you don't want no job. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Minnie, you don't need no job. Miss Minnie just stand there. And so he's praying for people and he says to her, Minnie, she goes, yeah. Do you know what I'm praying for? Yeah. I'm asking God to give you a job. Oh, no, I don't want no job. <laughs> and she turned around and went and sat back down. <laughs> well, that was a great day. And I love what Miss Minnie said. She said, I'm glad your daddy asked me because I know if he prayed, God's going to give it to me. See, I learned that growing up. We would ask people, are you sure? Because if we pray, it's going to happen. That's what your family should know about your prayers. Does your family have the kind of faith that they know if you pray, if you start calling on God, if it's left between you and God, it's going to happen. That's how you change your family, not with the arguments, not with telling them they're wrong, not with trying to convince them and beat up on them and tell them they need to come to church, not with comparing their life to how their life used to be, and I can't believe the choices you've made. By the simplicity of you living a life in God well, 
and the revelation of you walking with God convincing them that it's worth them walking with God. That's how you change them. That's how we walk. All right. Have you been blessed tonight? Yes. All right. We thank the Lord. To all of those that are watching, we thank God that you've taken time out of your schedule, and we just pray the blessing of the Lord be upon you, upon your family, that God would help heal you in any place that you've been wounded, and that God would cause the grace of God that goes beyond your imagination to invade every place of your world and cause the peace of God to be seen. And I pray the same thing for everyone in this room. I pray that the peace of God would cover you, that God would invade your families, that he would show you a different way to respond, and that the kingdom of God would manifest in every relationship. Now may the peace, the power, and the presence of God be in your house, in your home, and in your future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Be in prayer for us. Um, this weekend we're going to be traveling. We'll be in Ojai, California. So for those of you who are connecting from there, we look forward to seeing you at Redemption. It is Redemption Church. Yes, okay, I want to make sure I said it right. So, yes, we'll be at Redemption Church in Ojai all this weekend. We're looking forward to being with you. I believe uh, Pastor Debbie and Gary Smith are going to be with us, and Pastor Jim Bain is flying into town. And so we're bringing a team to you all. It's going to be phenomenal. The last time we were there, we saw great healings and a great outbreak of the Holy Spirit. So we look forward to being with you. Also, this Sunday, who's preaching here? So you've got Brother Michael Lockett. He's going to be preaching. So please, all of those who are in town, connected, please be in the house on Sunday. I love to hear this man of God when he speaks. He always brings such a pastoral, confirming, healing word. And so I know the word of the Lord is with him. So we got great services going on in different locations. It's going to be a great time. We love you. We bless you. We'll stay connected to you. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, God is.